Welcome everybody back to the Brotherhood Podcast. Uh, we have another installment here today with a very special guest, uh, Duke all-time great uh, defensive player of the year, assistant coach here for over 10 years. Uh, we successfully coached us to two national championships, uh, and he was recently named head coach of the Salt, Liddy Sa- Salt Lake City Stars, uh, the Utah Jazz G affiliate, uh, Steve Wojciechowski. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Awesome. And we also have uh, Dave Bradley here to my left, uh, the creative director of all of our media here, who also worked uh, with Coach for over 10 years. So excited to get it going here. Uh, you're here this week uh, for your boys are in camp here. How are they enjoying it? They've loved it. You know, it's been it's been fun. This was a Christmas present to uh, to my kids, um, awesome. you know, this past Christmas. And, um, you know, I always loved going to camp when I was a kid and uh, and I love Duke. And I love my sons, so it was like the perfect meeting of of all three. And uh, we had a great; they've had a great week here. There's amazing camp coaches. It's a really w- well run camp, and uh, being a dad allows me to do some some stuff besides, uh, you know, um, running a camp, which was generally what I do. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's been a great great trip. Nice. And how much are you? I'm sure. Uh, how much do you control yourself in terms of pushing them towards playing basketball? Do they play a number of sports? Do you try and manage that? Yeah, I mean, they're different, yeah. as as brothers often are. My older son um, played, mul- played multiple sco- sports in high school, uh, but recently, you know, it seems like his favorite is, is basketball. Yeah. Um, my younger son has always loved hoops. Uh, but for me, you know, I, I was net when I was a kid – um, I was never forced into to playing basketball. I didn't, I didn't grow up in a coaching family. My dad was a longshoreman on the docks of Baltimore. My mom was a homemaker and a world-class one at that. Yeah. Um, so I'll always support their interests and passions. Um, and if they ask me when it uh, pertains to hoops to help them, I'll help them. But if they don't, I'm, I'm not going to push it. I want them to find their own, their own path. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned uh, your family grew up in the Baltimore area. Um, You decide after uh, being a McDonald's All-American to come to Duke. Can you go, can you talk me through that decision process, where else you were looking, how you you landed at Duke? Yeah, my recruiting process was pretty unique. I mean, I was a good player in high school, but after my junior year, um, I was really looking at the University of Pennsylvania or Princeton. That was kind of the level um, that I was being recruited at, which great level. I mean, talking about big time schools. Um, and then after my junior year, I went to a camp called five star and ended up getting MVP of the camp. And the guy who ran it was a guy named Howard Garfinkel, uh, called Sonny Vaccaro. And Sonny at that time was in between Nike and Adidas and worked for Converse for a year. Uh, the old grandmama react juices. And I, as a favor to, uh, Mr. Garf, I got invited to Sonny's camp. Um, and I was one of the last invites, maybe the last invite. And uh, long story short, they put me on a team with eight Europe, Eastern Europeans, mm-hmm. none of whom spoke English. Wow. And uh, so it was me and a bunch of other guys with long last names that were really hard to pronounce playing against the, you know, uh, Antoine Walkers and Felipe Lopez's and Stefan Marbury's of the world. And we ended up having a, great camp and you know when I found out my team you know your initial reaction is like why you know why like why am I on a t- I should be on team Baltimore or team DMV or whatever and uh but quickly flipped the switch and and it worked out perfectly because it allowed me to play to my strengths mm-hmm. you know the reality is like if I was playing on a team where I had to show out by being a one-on-one player and getting buckets. I, I would not have looked very good. Yeah. Uh, but I was on a team that wanted to be led, even though we didn't speak the same language, and shared the ball and played team basketball. And so it allowed me to play to my strengths. And so in the period of about four weeks, I uh, went from being a low major recruit to – the Dukes and North Carolinas of the world. Um, I grew up, a, uh, my, my first love was Len Bias and the, the, the Terrapins. Maryland, yeah. um, 
But in, you know, when I was 10 or 11, that's when Johnny Dawkins and Mark Allery and David Henderson and uh, Jay Billis and that crew was kind of took Duke to another level. That class took that that class is the foundation we all stand on now. Yeah. Um, and so I loved it. And Wojciechowski, Krzyzewski, when I went to kind of the Polish parties on my dad's side of the family, it was like it wasn't really a decision. And yeah. uh and then built a great relationship with Coach K um, in the recruiting process and ended up coming to Duke. Yeah. Can, can you tell the story, apparently a soccer game that you had, you were a soccer player as well. Yeah. You got Coach Smith and Coach K watching you play soccer. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was surreal. Um, you know, I was, I was, when I was young, I, was, I, was really, I, don't, I wasn't really good in basketball. I was really good in soccer. And, uh, but then as I got old, like when I went to high school, I still played soccer all four years and w was still able to be pretty good. Um, but I focused on basketball. Um, so instead of having like, you know, preseason workouts that I would do at like normal times, they might, they were either first thing in the morning or last thing at night, uh, college coaches would come to my soccer games or soccer practices. And we were playing our rival, um, uh, and on one end of the field, there was Coach K on the, and Coach K and Mike Bray. And on the other end of the field was Dean Smith and Phil Ford, which, you know, like an inner city, you know, soccer, you know, just very unique um, to see, you know, like two of the, the, great, the greatest of all time, in my opinion, in Coach K and one of the greatest in, in Coach Smith at a soccer game in the middle of Baltimore City, um, watching a, you know, a five ten midfielder play soccer, so it, uh, yeah. Some you know, I I don't think back. I've had more time to think back of my on my journey recently, but um, you know, some of the things that happened to me are are absolutely wild, and that's one of them. Yeah, no, that's up there. That's pretty. That's pretty crazy. So you commit to Duke. You get here. You spend four years here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, by the end of your career, you're top 10 all time for Duke, steals and assists. Do you have a most memorable moment over those four years you can think back on? Probably my senior night. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my last game in Cameron. It was the last game of the regular season. There was a ACC regular season title on the line, which to me is the most meaningful of titles mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's a duration. At that time, it was round robin. Uh, the league was very, very good. We were down 17 early in the second half, and this was before Cameron was air conditioned, um, and it was as hot. I mean, it was early, you know, it was early March, but it was like car gym is now in the middle of, of or the late June. It was so hot. Uh, we changed jerseys at halftime. Coach K ripped his shirt at halftime. Uh, he had to change shirt. He came out was wearing a suit and tie to start the game was wearing a golf polo to finish the game <laughs> and uh it was an incredible incredible moment uh for me and um you know that was that was a real highlight in my career people talk about and you mentioned it with the heat <laughs> the term is always thrown around here as like if we win a big game it gets a little crazy people say it was vintage cameron tonight what does that mean i know you've been back a few times and obviously you coached here for many years after you played when you think about Cameron now versus then, what are the big things that stick out when people say, like, vintage Cameron? Well, to me, it's when the energy of, of everybody in the building who's for Duke is connected mm -hmm. and completely immersed in the game. And, um, you know, that's harder and harder to cultivate now, I think. And it, it didn't always happen when I played. But – at that moment on that day, if you were in the gym and you were rooting for Duke, and that was probably everybody except 40 people sitting behind the Carolina bench, um, their energies were connected. Yeah. And as a result, the, the feeling in the gym was palpable to everybody there, uh, including the guys who played at Carolina. Um, and that's what makes – Cameron is a very special building. Um, but the people make it come alive. Yeah, you know that 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 brings out Cameron's gifts. Is if the if the players, the students, the staff are connected, 
um, that's that's when it's vintage Cameron. Yeah. And it's always really good. And most of the time, it's great. But a, a vintage Cameron is when everybody in there is connected on one mission. Yeah. Talk about everybody being connected. I have a interesting anecdote about this, but you're credited as the, the godfather as the Duke floor staff. Do you take credit for that? I don't take credit for it. Um, Tommy Amaker and that crew started it. Okay. Um, it's just the best thing I did as a player. <laughs> so that's what everybody remembers me for <laughs> is, is, is slapping the floor. And I don't know whether to take that as a compliment or, or not. Um, but, you know, slapping the floor, it, its genesis is rooted in a call to action. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I took pride in being a leader here. And I took pride in being responsible for when there was a collective call to action. Yeah. And that's that's what the floor slap is. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and people can interpret it different ways, but it was it was a call to action to the guys to to be connected, to to lock lock in kind of spiritually, emotionally together and uh physically try to get a stop. Yeah. And so uh that's what the that's what the floor stop is to me. Mm -hmm. Um again, I wish it wasn't the best thing I did as a player. Uh but I'm you know, still still reminded of it. You know, yeah. I still get asked quite frequently to slap the floor. So <laughs> it um, seems like there is an art to the timing of it. So I don't know if you remember First of all, the best example, as a good example, is, is, is your senior night. Down yeah. 17, you're doing it, the place is going crazy. I don't know if you remember 2006, I think it was, maybe 2005, Jamal Boykin comes in, uh, first time in a Duke uniform. We're up 60, slap on the floor. Not the right time, necessarily. Right. How do you know when the time is right for the floor slap? You know, I, mean, I, think, it's, I think it's a feel. Um, and not, sometimes not, a, not everybody feels the same. Um, but there, there's there's significant moments where, uh, when it's utilized, it can be really effective. It doesn't always work because the teams you're playing against are really good. Uh, but it works at the right moment to join a team together. I mean, just because something doesn't work, it doesn't mean it wasn't the right thing. Uh, so um, you, you kind of have to have a feel. There's, it's not every moment can't be, uh, you know, a draw a line in the sand type moment. But there are moments when you're in it enough that you, you know, you can feel it. And, and sometimes you need to make that known to the guys that you're playing with or the people who are supposed to be involved in the game with you. Because not everybody is going to have the right feel. Yeah. Is that something you've kept with you coaching because um, what I was going to mention, it's become such a huge part of just basketball culture in general. I didn't really know that it was a Duke thing until a few years ago. Obviously, I was coached by Chris Collins, your teammate here, and we were getting beat uh, maybe my sophomore year at Michigan State. I remember it very well. We were getting beat towards the end of the game, and their whole team slapped the floor. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. I don't think a ton of our guys thought anything of it. But after the game, I remember you know Collins was livid and yeah. felt like unbelievably dis disrespected. <laughs> And I didn't know the majority of us guys, I don't know if it's because we're too young or just because it's yeah. such a big basketball thing in general now to do, you know, all of us were like, what is he so upset about? Um, and then, yeah, I remember us all researching after the game, like seeing that it was like started at Duke. Um, so is that something you've, you know, through your time at Marquette, maybe this upcoming time, is it something you try to instill in your guys? Well, no, nobody, when I was coaching here or playing here, I'm sorry, uh, it's organic. Like if you need to coach somebody to do it, and a lot of coaches do, mm -hmm. and your situation may have been one of them. Yeah. Um, but the the more it can be organic, the better it is. Um, you know, and so that should come from the team. So I I, I never wanted to put that on my. I, I mean, I was hopeful that whatever the call to action is at those big moments in big games, to 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 really lock in together, uh, it should come from the players. Uh, so I did I never really, I never really coached yeah. it. Also, I didn't want, anyway, I never really coached it. 
Uh, last part, last question I have for you about your, your time playing at, at Duke. Is there anything, you know, something you know now that you wish you knew back then? If you could go back in time and tell yourself as a player. Yeah, you know, it's um, getting, I'm getting old. Um, you know, most of the, the, the things I would say is that the, this experience at Duke, um, people are, are going to, to pour into you and you're going to pour into the program, or at least that's how it should be. Um, and there's going to be different points along the way where your experience is, is going to teach you lessons. And sometimes when you're younger, the ability to re receive those lessons and give those lessons the right meaning in your life, it's harder because you, you just don't have the maturity to do it. Um, but the thing I value the most from, from my playing career is the people I got to share it with. Uh, from the coaches to my teammates, many of whom, you know, I'm, I'm very close to now, um, and the lessons the game taught me. Yeah. Uh, you know, like basketball's had a huge, it's, basketball's fingerprints are all over m my life. Uh, but basketball, while I have been able to experience like the highest of the highs in the game, it teaches you lessons when you're at the top of the mountain or when you're in the valley. And sometimes as a player, you, the way you assess those situations is maybe not as deep mm -hmm. as you should. Because when you get to be my age, and that's a long way off for you, not as long for Dave, um, you draw upon those in your, your life's journey. Yeah. That, that have nothing to do with sport. It has to do with the relationships that you have with your kids or your family or the times where life knocks you to the canvas or the times where you're a part of a group and a team, whatever team that is at that moment, uh, where you achieve something together. And there's, mm -hmm. there's not a better feeling than that. And so, you know, as a what I would tell players is – you know, you're, there's going to be different feelings and emotions that come up through their own basketball journey. Make sure you're you're able to receive them as best you can, and make sure you give it the right meaning. Yeah. Because you'll draw if you use it correctly, you'll draw on that forever. Yeah. Um, and the second thing I would tell the players is that relationships matter. Um, because yeah, I remember when I was in college, you know, it's like the world revolves around you. And that's a part of youth. And that's a part of immaturity a lot of times. Um, but the more you can lock arms with really good people, even when really good people are telling you hard things, yeah. um, the better life experience you'll have beyond, well beyond basketball, which for me is the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you graduate from Duke, <clears throat> you go to play in Poland for a year, and then you come back uh, and are you know become a member of the the full time staff here. Was coaching something you always envisioned yourself envisioned yourself doing, or was it something you kind of stumbled upon? No, I always I mean outside of my family, the biggest influences in my life were my coaches, mm -hmm. and you know I mean I thought I would get into coaching. Now I thought I would be at the high school level. Um, when I came back from Poland, I was actually going to take a job at the Naval Academy working for Don DeVoe. Wow. Um, but I was down here, coach had just had hip surgery, and uh, I went to visit him in the hospital on the day before Quinn Snyder took the Missouri job. Okay. Yeah. And while I was in the hospital, coach asked me, I was 21, and I coached half the returning guys at the time, or all the return, I, I played with all the returning players. Uh, at the time, I didn't play with any of the incoming freshmen. Uh, he asked me if I wanted to join his staff. Yeah. And uh, I had to make sure it wasn't the uh, pain medication talking. <laughs> so once I realized that, I obviously quickly took the job. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't realize that you had coached then former teammates. That's got to be a pretty Chris, crazy, interesting dynamic. Chris Carowell, Nate James, and Shane Batty, there were only three scholarship players left in the program okay. when yeah. I took the job. Wow. Um, that was the first year guys went pro. Yeah. So my first my first week on the job, Elton Brand went pro, who I played with. William Avery went pro, uh, who I played with. Corey McGetty left. 
after his freshman year, uh, the original kind of one and done. Mm-hmm. And Chris Burgess transferred to Utah. Wow. Um, so we had three guys remaining. And it was Shane, it was Nate, and Sewell. And there couldn't have been a better three guys yep. to have returning. And then we had a pretty good recruiting class coming in, and Jason Williams, Jay Williams, Jason Williams to me. Yeah. Um, Mike Dunleavy, Carlos Boozer, uh, Casey Sanders, uh, Nick Horvath. Yeah. It's not a bad class. And uh, started out the year 0-2. Uh, lost at Madison Square Garden to Stanford and UConn. And uh, that team ended up winning the – Regular season, Chris Carwell was, I think, ACC Player of the Year. I had a dynamite senior year. And uh, that was the beginning of my – I was 21, yeah. you know, which is pretty young, especially at Duke. Yeah. But it was uh, it was the start of a great uh, journey here. Yeah. And then you win two national titles as a coach, 2001 and 2010. What made those two teams so special in your eyes? Uh, the players. Mm-hmm. I mean – in 2001, you had Shane and Nate. I don't know if there's ever been a better leader yeah. uh, or leadership duo than those two. Shane was just an alien when it came to leadership. Um, and then the young guys who were freshmen, and, and you know, we took our took our lumps by Duke standards, um, but they they kind of all blossom into to great players. Um, you know that team. We we Carlos Boozer broke his foot. We play in the University of Maryland, who at that time that rivalry was, in my opinion, equal to the Carolina rivalry. Mm-hmm. Carlos broke his foot on Chain Senior Night, and we lost. We had one more game left. We had to go to to Carolina, and Carlos was going to be done for the season, is what everybody thought. Um, and you know, had an unbelievable team meeting that next morning. Went over to Carolina and. You know, we started Casey Sanders, who hadn't played much at center, and Reggie Love, who was, a, who was the guy I recruited to play football and basketball as our backup center, who's 6'5". Yeah. Um, and we, we, we didn't lose from there, and we actually ended up getting Carlos back in the Final Four. But that team went through some adversity, and they very, very easily could have uh, – not been national champions, but their character was incredible. And 2010 was the most – in 2001, I, I was too young to appreciate it. Yeah. I was, I was young and dumb. Um, 2010, I appreciated it. That, that, was my, that was the most fun I ever had coaching. Wow. Uh, to this day. That team was – that team took its lumps um, over the course of four years. We lost Gerald Henderson to the draft after his junior year, and, and people thought we were going to be good, but not necessarily because of our talent. They just we were old and good, yeah. and uh, they ended up being champions. Yeah. And that team's character was beyond reproach. And so many guys contrib- We we would not have won if not if one person on the roster didn't contribute to the level they did and everybody contributed and it was it was a magical magical year yeah super impressive and obviously uh coach shire i know it was coach shire john shire was was on the team there what was he like to coach any any good stories i can bring back to the locker room (laughs) i do have good stories but i ain't i ain't giving any to bring back to the locker room um john was a natural John was a great competitor, and you know, like, you know, even people like John was a great. John was a great competitor. Mm-hmm. That was his greatest gift. I mean, he could shoot and he could handle, and he was smart, but he was a competitive genius, while being like a normal good person. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, if you guys can can do what he did in that respect. You'll, you'll, your team's going to be just fine. Yeah. Do you think, Wojo, that you can teach competitiveness? Obviously, you're as competitive a human as any that's ever won the Duke uniform in any sport. Coach Shire up there, too. Is that something you're raised with, can, or can you teach it, or what, or what do you think on that? I don't, you know, the, the old born with or yeah. learned. I think, 
I think some people are born with that that lean. Um, but I also think, I think a lot of competition comes from how deeply you care about something, and you know the the depths you're willing to go, physically, emotionally, you know, even at sometimes spiritually, to accomplish what you want to accomplish with a group. So I think people can learn that. Um, so I, I think it's a combination. Yeah, absolutely. And then coach, again, uh, with my you know, coach Northwestern, Chris Collins, he used to talk all the time about you guys playing twos after practice to 100. How did that come about? Was that always a do thing? Was that you guys trying to stay in shape? Well, we were both pretty young when we got into coaching. Um, and, you know, we love to play. Mm -hmm. we, we just, neither one of us probably were good enough to have careers in the game where it made sense for us to keep playing, although we probably could have. Um, so we loved to play, and we wanted to kind of feed that love. Uh, we loved to compete, and we wanted to stay in shape. Uh, so it evolved where we were going two-on-two, two, three on three to – 120 full court where you don't inbound the ball yeah. so you get out of the net and go unbelievable workout <laughs> i mean i think uh chris would tell you that we may have been in better shape as staff members when we were in our 20s than we were when we were playing because we also hit our prime as players yeah so um it was it was super fun so we we'd grab whoever would play yeah. and but we were always on the same team because it wouldn't have been very healthy for us to be on opposite teams. Yeah. Um, uh, but we, we won a lot of games. We yeah. won a lot of games together. So it was, it, was, it was good. It was fun. Yeah. And then so just thinking about over the broad landscape of your time coaching college basketball, a few quick hitters for you. Um, favorite thing about college basketball? Um, you know, the passion mm -hmm. for it. I, I I think, you know, throughout college basketball, uh, the passion that can be generated between schools and their teams and players and their fans is unique. Like it's in, in some levels, it can be more than a game, yeah. which is, you know, it's I don't know if you'd necessarily get at other levels. Yeah. One thing you change about college basketball. Uh, we don't have enough time, brother. <laughs> uh <laughs> I would love to see um, much greater organization in college basketball. Mm. Um, I love the fact that players players are getting what they probably should have gotten for a long time, uh, it's, and it's been a long time since I was a player. I mean, I would have benefited from that as yeah. a player. Surprisingly enough, they sold my jerseys in the bookstore. Um, but – like I think about coaches a lot. And um, one of the things I love that the change I love for players is it's not just getting paid, but there's much more attention paid to their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an unsustainable business for coaches. Yeah. And what you're going to do is you're going to lose people who are wickedly talented uh, at coaching, but also the best – the best models for growth and development as humans are going to leave. Yeah. And, um, and you already seeing some of that. Yeah. And so if college basketball doesn't figure it out, uh, it's, it's just going to be a money grab for everybody. And that's, that's friggin' wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be much urgency, uh, you know, in that respect. Yeah. And that'll be uh, a decent transition. We wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, you came and addressed the team uh, two days ago and spoke a lot about you know a healthy life balance. You just touched upon it. But these past few years since Marquette, you've been able to to do some different things. Uh, we're reading about you know all the things you've done to stay active. You're pretty close with Jesse Etzler with all of his events like that. Is that again back to you know what you're talking about, just staying conditioned? But um, how did you get into those type of events, those endurance you know hiking events? Um, I, I always feel my best when I'm moving mm -hmm. and, um, so I like to move and I like to move with community. Yeah. Um, 
and Jesse is a guy that sees the world the same. Now, I haven't done all the crazy <laughs> shit Jesse's done, uh, but I enjoy being a part of a community and I enjoy moving. Um, you know, I mean, this, it's funny, you know, the, the story I would have told myself about being fired prior to being fired was a, was a tragedy. Um, and the, the story I know now is it's one of the best things to ever happen to me. And you talk about balance. I don't, I don't necessarily believe in balance, okay. uh, cause ba balance is defined as equal distribution. And when you're trying to do something, uh, great, you're, you're not always going to be equally distributed. And so what I talk to coaches about is finding harmony. Yeah. And that means certain pieces of the certain members of the band whether it's work whether it's family whether it's the things that fill your own tank need need you need to have time for them to take s a center stage yeah. and i think it's really important for people who are trying to achieve a sustainable high level of success there needs to be harmony between the things that are important to you at times you're going to you're going to have to do things that are way out of balance to be a really good player. That can't be all the time. You're going to have to do things way out of balance to be a really good coach. That can't be all the time. There's there, it, it, there needs to be harmony and an ebb and flow between the things that are really important to you. And you always need to be mindful of that and make the necessary adjustments or else you may achieve, but you're going to be empty in other ways. Hmm. So, what I talk to coaches about is finding the harmony um, because balance doesn't exist yeah. in any shape. Um, you know, if you're trying to do something really well, or if you're trying to achieve balance, it's, you're never, you're always going to be unhappy because you're never going to achieve it. Yeah. Now's the time to work, work center stage. Good. That your part, that part of the song is over with. Now it's family to be center stage. And it's more about being present with the things that you're passionate about, as opposed to equally distributing them throughout your days, weeks, months, and years. Yeah. So Ryan, I knew Wojo for like a decade here. And when you work closely with someone, you get to know them on a great level. We became great friends. He goes to Marquette. And I watched probably 25% of the games as often as I could, but you're not staying in touch as often. Great win, right. whatever. And so, you know, and then, and then Wojo leaves. I got to go out to Utah to spend some time. and. A lot of Wojo was the same, but he thought there's like a part of him was like completely different. It's awesome hike. We're having dinner together. We spent like a lot of time out there, and you you seem like a completely different guy with this this new outlook. What was it about the the Marquette experience specifically that like that led to that? And and I say that in a really positive way. Like Kenny King and I on the side. Kenny was there. He's our buddy. We were like shocked by like a different Wojo in, in all the right ways. Yeah, I mean, well, one, I the time to reflect about and get really clear. You know, sometimes when you're in coaching, the inertia of the job and the, like the next thing you want to accomplish it just moves you forward without time to think and clear and ask yourself, like, is this, is this what I really want? You know, at, at, at every level. And so I had a chance to be really clear with what I wanted. Um, I think it's always been in there. <laughs> it's just, you know, sometimes you need to get punched in the mouth to realize, like, no, this isn't, this isn't right. Um, you know, and, and for a lot of, a lot of reasons, but, you know, I think some of the people that I've talked to coaches get fired and they, they ask me like, can I talk to you? Cause you seem like so happy, you know, I'm like, well, and, um, I think you, you need to, you have time to get really clear and figure out what works for you. And, um, you need to try to, to, to do those things. Uh, a lot of what worked for me wasn't right. Right. And it worked till it didn't, it wasn't right when it was working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just being really honest with yourself and, and not, not playing the victim card. Mm -hmm. Like there's things that happen to you where you, you really, there's a missed opportunity because it's very easy to say, well, if they didn't do that or if this didn't happen, that's the wrong way to do it. Because at the end of the day, you have no control over that. 
what other people do or what other people say or what other people think. You have, you have, you can influence and impact it maybe to a certain degree, but you have no control. Mm -hmm. And so what happens a lot with coaches, like, well, it was, it was this or that, like I wanted, I took that off the table and said, like, you're not spending any time with that. So I'm at peace with it. I appreciate my Marquette experience. I appreciate many, many of the people that I interacted with there. There's a lot of things I could have done better. And it's my job to, to take those lessons in, do the same things I'm telling. I said to the players, like receive the messages. Don't, don't not receive the messages because it's easier to put the blame on somebody else as opposed to look yourself in the mirror. That's a mistake. And mm -hmm. it's not a mistake that I plan on making happen again. And you're pretty close to Coach Shire. Is there any like Duke specific wisdom along these lines that, that you might share with him or have shared with him? John is a absurdly talented human being. And he marries that with being a incredibly good person. So when John is at his best, the people that he wants to serve will benefit from his many, many gifts. One of the things that can happen in coaching because the waves never stop crashing, recruiting, uh, handling relationships that come with the, the program, the stress of the job, the expectations, the spotlight that is unique to Duke, all those waves never stop. And so John needs to make sure that he can show up as close to what his 10 is every day. And that means he's got to take care of himself. And that's not selfish. It's selfish if you do it the other way. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to try to surf 100 waves today. Like, you're going to drown. Over time, you're going to drown. Uh, so for me, like, John and I, I mean, we'll talk about basketball, but that's not my priority with John. My priority with John is what are you doing to take care of yourself and the people you care most about? Because if you're at your best, everybody else is going to benefit the most. And the reality is when you're the head coach, people don't think about that. Yeah. The people who work for you think about themselves. The players think about the, And that, that doesn't mean they're bad people. They're human. Uh, the athletic department, the school, they're thinking about themselves. Like, you got to think about you mm -hmm. and just bring your best. And that's good enough, man. It doesn't mean it's always going to work out. Things are going to go perfectly. It doesn't mean you're going to go undefeated. But over time, all the things you, all the people and things you care about have the best chance to work out like you want it to. Absolutely. Uh, so just to quickly, I guess, wrap this up. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, you take these two years uh, that we just talked about, and then just in about a month or so now since you've taken the position in Utah, what, what drew you to that? To that opportunity, what are you most excited about? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a great opportunity. You know, um, I I've loved these last two years. I've gotten to do some really cool stuff, and I don't plan on stopping doing cool stuff. But there's two parts of coaching I missed. I missed being a part of a team. Yeah. And when you're part of a team that's striving to do high level things. There's shared experiences that can only kind of – it's one of the only places that, that that level of shared experience is created. And I missed the human connection. Mm -hmm. I missed – and uh, I missed sharing human experiences with people who are also passionate about the game of basketball. Um, I miss that. Yeah. I'll miss recruiting. Uh, there's other areas I don't miss at all. <laughs> um but I miss those two areas. Yeah. How do you, when you're thinking about choosing pro over college, you talked about to our group about how it's interesting for you to be on the other side of things, especially with the draft um, last week. Um, being on that, you know, what was the biggest eye-opening experience for you there after you spent so much time? Uh, you mentioned a few days ago trying to help guys get to the NBA, and you know, now you switch seats. You're on the other side of it. What was that experience like? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm going in there with, I think, humility that I don't have all the answers and I'm trying to learn that level. The, the game is the same, not completely because the rules and all that kind of stuff are different and, and the level of talent 
in general is is much better. Mm-hmm. Um, the, but the game essentially is the same. The business is like wildly different. Yeah, wildly different, and um, it's and so that creates that creates different scenarios that you do, you don't deal with in in college. Um, or different things that you're, are your responsibility in college. They, it's not my responsibility mm-hmm. uh, in the pros. So, and the people who run the NBA, that's all they're thinking about is how to make their business really successful, the best sports league in the world. That's all they're consumed about. So their decisions are made to try to reach that that goal. Um, it's it's just very different in college. There's other things that come into play, uh, so it's been fun. Yeah. How do you, how do you envision, if at all, your coaching strategy changing alongside what you're mentioning about the business? I feel like I always have guys that you know come back or former teammates that talk about the G League. It's much more, you know, guys are trying to use it as a springboard to get them to you know play in the NBA or or maybe overseas elsewhere. It seems like you know getting your stats up is more important than it was in college. How do you think you're going to try and attack that dynamic change in the way that, you know, maybe guys in the G League are more concerned about how this is going to help them individually versus in college, maybe players in general are, are, you know, more concerned with winning and losing as a team? Yeah, well, I think um, guys that are concerned with getting their stats up just need to come to the the recognition recognition that that's not what the parent organizations or organizations in the NBA are looking for. Mm. So they're, they're coming from a flawed thought process. Uh, you know, whether they believe me or not, that's not, you know, like the, the people I work for in Utah are not like whoever scores 35 a game is the guy we're bringing up. Yeah. In fact, the G league a lot in a lot of respects are, uh, is a way for the guys that they already recognize value in, but need to be developed in certain areas. Much of much of which is not scoring. Mm-hmm. You know, like Lowry Marketing's going to score. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or two years before that, Donovan Mitchell is the scorer, and these guys have to learn to value the other areas of the game because that's how they're going to make their initial mark. Now, I would never stand in the way of uh, of a guy playing to his strengths. And if scoring is a strength, that should be the reason. I mean, that should be something they play to. But if you're in the G League and scoring is your strength, the reason that you're in the G League is to develop the other areas of the game so you can always be with the parent organization yeah. and not with me. Yeah. And so I think it, I think it all – I think it's just communication, you know, and understanding – and having the self-aware, understanding what the Jazz want and having the self-awareness to say, I'm going to try to get that done, and that's going to be part of my job. And I look forward to it. Yeah. Uh, the guys are are beyond professional. Yeah. Beyond professional. There's no, there's no immature games at that level because mm-hmm. immaturity gets squeezed out in a heart- heartbeat. And... Sometimes coming from college, where not saying here, but other places where you're, you're at times you're catered, your immaturity is catered to because it's so easy to leave a place now. That's not how it works. That's not how the real world works. Yeah. It's just not. And so the more you can, you can start to think with a real world approach, meaning the NBA, the better off you're going to be. Because if you go there with the expectation that that's the organization is going to cater to you, that doesn't mean they're they don't care about you as a human being. That doesn't mean they're they're not going to try to help you as a human. But they ain't catering to your feelings at all. Yeah, at all. And the more young players can wrap that uh, wrap their arms around that and say, no, this is what it is. Like the better and the quicker they'll be better. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate that, that perspective, especially as a, as a player. Um, so again, just to wrap this up, we're big trivia guys here. I'm a huge trivia fan myself. We have five Duke trivia questions about your career specifically okay. uh, to wrap this up. So 
Hope you go five five here. This first one should be a, a layup for you. Do you remember your senior year record and ACC record? Uh, we were thirty two and four. Yep. ACC record, we were probably sixteen and two. Fifteen and one Fif ACC. Fifteen and one. Do you remember where the loss was? Well, it had to be Carolina. Was it Carolina? Yeah, not Carolina. All right. Number two, you led the ACC in steals in 1967, 1966, Come on, 60, man. 97. How many did you have? 1967? 1997. I know I look old, brother, but shoot. Seven. Um, How many did you have? Uh, is that my senior year? No, that would have been your junior my year. My junior year? Yeah. So we would have played 30 games. I probably averaged close to two and a half steals a game, so 30, 35. Probably low 80s, probably low 80s. Yep, 82. 82. Yeah, that's, there we that's go. Correct. Six, number three, six different Duke players have won National Defensive Players of the Year. Can you name the other five outside of yourself? Sheldon Williams, Billy King, Tommy Amaker, Shane Battier three times. Um, how many is that, four? Yeah, I'm missing four. one. And I'm missing one. Billy, did I say Billy? He said Billy, Billy yeah. Tommy, Billy, Sheldon. It's an okay. obvious one, I'd say, right, TV? Yeah. Easy one. Just before your time. You're thinking too hard about Probably it. Probably the year before you got to Duke. Oh, uh, Grant. Yeah. Yes. Number four. Oh, I think he answered this, right? The deficit? Yeah, but, well, he didn't get the number of assists. Okay. So, in your senior night game for UNC in 1998, uh, you already recited the halftime deficit, which was going to be the question. We'll ask how many assists you had in that game. Uh, 10, I think. 11. 11. 11. One off. And then lastly, number five, can you name five of the 10 players who earned all ACC, all ACC honors in both 96, 97, and 97, 98, so your junior and senior year? All AC, the guys I played with? You were all ACC those last few years. Well, Trajan would have been in, yeah, in there. Yeah, Rashawn would have been in there a senior year. Um, Elton? No. No. Are these just these are all ACC no. This guys. is, and this is Andy, not just so, Duke. This yeah. could be other guys from other oh, schools. Oh, Antoine Jameson. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Tim Duncan. Not Tim. Not Tim Duncan. Uh, Tim Duncan. Well, he was I think a year off. He was, was like just going my senior year. <laughs> no, it was a complicated question. All ACC in '97 season and '98 season. I think Tim Duncan got out of college basketball in 97, and that was why he okay. didn't make this list. So it's um, Antoine Jameson, Vince Carter. Yep. Yeah. Rashawn Trajan, Terrell McIntyre. Yes. Um, i trying to think who's Maryland's best player. I don't know. Is that five? I think that's good. That's definitely five. five. Who are Ron, these other? Clint Ron Harrison? Prophet. NC State, Clint NC Harrison. State, Harrison. Laren Prophet. LaRon Prophet. LaRon yeah. Prophet. Shamond Williams. Yeah, Shamond. Shamond. Who else? Greg Buckner. Yeah, Clemson. Matt Harvey. Really good. Hmm. Brother of a Duke player. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg Buckner. We do have a sixth question for yeah. just for Coach Wojo. Here we go. Uh, so during your, your visit here this week, I played pickleball maybe once before camp started early in the morning. One point if you can name your opponent, and 10 points if you can name the score. Uh, in in the in the pickleball match, and maybe a few points for in your partner. In the third game, the whole all three games, the score, name the opponents. You get some points for that, and of course your partner, you should get yeah. a few points. My partner who carried me, right, carried me, Dave Bradley. Yep, mean pickleball game. <laughs> quick quick hands, surprisingly quick feet for his age. <laughs> um, hand eye coordination was was on point. Um, we played against Coach Shire and Coach Lucas, you yeah. know, which it's supposed to be a super team. I've they're, heard they're really they're very very good. We yeah. they just caught us on the wrong day. <laughs> um, very very good players, really competitive. Got to work on their teamwork a little bit, um, but you know, worthy opponents. Uh, the scores I, I don't really keep score. We yeah. won. There we go. Uh, That's correct. Lot, by a lot, I think the third third yeah. game. The uh, best out of three. Yeah, nice. but you know, you just you just got to wear teams down, you know, <laughs> physically, emotionally, and we were able to fortunately do that. But John was probably just trying to make me feel welcome. Uh, wear him down. You got to get him playing those one hundred twenty-five pickup games after practice. <laughs> He's he probably he played in a few. 
He played in a few, I think. Yeah. So. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, I know you got to get out of the hotel and get your boys home, but uh, we appreciate you being here. This is, you know, incredible. Obviously, just for me as a player to to hear you speak and and some of the knowledge you have about all these things, but also obviously for our fans and just followers of the Brotherhood, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, man. You guys, uh, you and your teammates make us really proud. Um, you know, it's a it's a special place. Like I told the team the other day, and it's because of the people. And so for all the guys who wore the jersey, you know, to see the young people who are wear, wearing it now represent it so well, both on and off the court, is is something we take a great deal of pride in. And uh, your addition's been a huge one, as I told you before we got going. You're uh, you got you got a big fan in me and 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 my boys. They love watching you play. Yeah. So if they can if they can if they can get the footwork and the shot fakes <laughs> down like you have it, I'd be real happy. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. We'll try to keep you keep you happy and make you more proud this year. All right, man. Thanks, Georgia. Sure.